we are absolutely delighted to have a special guest who's going to give us a keynote speech. So I'm asking you to please give a very warm welcome and applause to Margaret Vestager, Executive Vice President of the European Commission. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just for transparency, now I see none of you. <laughs> uh, and that was actually, uh, I think, uh, contrary to what you have been trying to achieve for 20 years. <laughs> uh, but uh, other than that, uh, dear friends, uh, if I may call you so, good afternoon and thank you very, very much. I think it is important to pause, to look back, in order to find the strength uh, to look forward, because without that, there is no learning, there is no fun. And, and that must be a uh, part of, uh, of, uh, of the work. So congratulations on 20 years of hard work and persistent uh, advocacy in defending and advancing digital uh, rights uh, in Europe. Today, Europe, uh, Europeans are safer, freer, and more empowered when going online, and a lot of that because of you. So thank you all, civil society organization, campaigners, lawyers, uh, academics, experts of every kind, for continuously raising awareness and feeding the political debate. And of course, for contributing to making our proposals, the Commission proposals, more robust, more targeted, more balanced, and more enforceable. I think your success in many digital uh, policies over the last years, uh, like the GDPR, like the Digital Services Act, well, they are also a success for our society as a whole. Because uh, Edris rhymes, the work rhymes extremely well with the Commission agenda, with the European agenda, and the way that we want to go digital. And it may seem trivial now to say that it's all about putting people in the center. It's all about making sure that technology serves us as humans, as citizens, as people. But it is not trivial, and it's not easily done. And there are other models. Making technology serve the state, or making technology serve corporations only. So even though it is obvious today 20 years ago, it was so not obvious. And already back then, it was your vision. It was your mission to fight for people's dignity in the digital world. And you anticipated the Brussels effects on regulating uh, internets and digital technologies. And, and looking back, I find that it's really remarkable what has been achieved over the last two decades, or maybe more specifically over the last 10 years, because things have really accelerated. And maybe because of this uh, and because of technology itself, well, the transformation has entered a whole new phase. Goes without saying, the more digital becomes an integral part of our everyday lives, the more it's also a challenge to our fundamental rights. And so much more, we will be needing your advocacy, we will be needing you in your role as a watchdog, and I am sure that I can count on you to do that. One of the key milestones of this digital journey, of course, has been the GDPR the General Data Protection Regulation. For the first time, we set in stone that uh, fundamental rights that we, as citizens, as consumers, as human beings, 
Well, we have rights as much uh, online as offline. The right to be forgotten, to own and control our data, to choose if we want to be tracked or not. And I think that GDPR sort of set the course for our democracy to catch up with technology. In, I think it has changed minds. It has changed debates. And because of that, it has changed laws all over the world. As Vivian Redding, commissioner at the time, pointed out at your 10th anniversary, you played an important role in improving what was tabled back in 2012 and during the subsequent steps to its adoption in 2016. And since the GDPR's implementation started, you've also been engaging closely, closely monitoring its enforcement, including, of course, filing numerous complaints. The next historic milestones for giving people back the control of their digital lives I think has been the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And your involvement has been welcomed here as well, and also decisive. These two pieces, uh, I consider this as, as landmark regulations. We'll be tackling uh, concentration in the digital world, and we will be addressing some of the digital challenges for democracy caused by technology. And again, I think we're setting a golden standard. Now, the task, of course, is to make others follow. Maybe not an exact copy, but to change minds, to change the political debate, for others also to take action. The Digital Services Act introduces much needed rules and obligations so that people can feel safe online as well as offline while at the same time putting the freedom of expression at the very core of the regulation. We make platforms responsible for taking down illegal content, but also for ensuring that perfectly legal content is not removed inadvertently. They will have to notify users when, um, when removing content, giving every one of us a chance to uh, complaint if we disagree. You promoted a number of principles mm -hmm. that feature very clearly in the final Digital Services Act, including strict obligations on big platforms when it comes to accountability, but also when it comes to transparency on the decisions that they take, as well as their content moderation policies uh, in general. Alongside with the DSA, we have also worked with a strengthened code of practice on disinformation. The COVID pandemic, and maybe in particular the Russians' war on Ukraine, have shown once again what a threat to our democracy we find in disinformation. Russian disinformation has turned uh, into a very dangerous weapon and the code is the first such framework on the entire planet, setting out commitments by platforms and industry to fight online disinformation, while again, preserving freedom of expression. And here, civil society organization, while well, they are fundamental in providing their expertise, in providing technical solutions, and as it was said in the welcome, under very different circumstances than the businesses that they are sometimes up against. So I will really encourage you to keep this focus, to play a monitoring role as we make the code a real thing in everyday life. As you will know, uh, the very large platforms will be designated under the Digital Services Act to have a particular responsibility to mitigate the risks arising from disinformation. 
In parallel with new digital legislation, we passed the Declaration on Digital Rights uh, and Principles. It was solemnly signed by the parliaments, the Council, and the European Commission. And also on this front, you were the visionaries. Back in 2014, already then, during the European uh, Parliament elections, well, you drafted a 10-point charter of digital rights to raise awareness among uh, members of parliament and candidates to become members of parliament. In our declaration, we made it absolutely clear that the fundamental rights that we have uh, offline, we have them online as well. And of course, I realize that this may sound like a slogan, but every one of the rights in the digital, in the declaration, is underpinned by legislation, by initiatives, that is going to make this real. And one of the things I think more precious than ever, also looking forward into metaverses, virtual worlds, is of course to care for freedom of expression and our right to privacy. I think, or I hope, that what we have put uh, in the declaration will work as a reference point to every one of us, because work is not done. And of course, we will push forward. We have the digital compass. We know where we want to be in 2030. But the real cardinal points of the compass is not the digitization of businesses and government and connectivity. It is the values that we put in there to make sure that this is a real thing in everyday life. Otherwise, of course, not worth the energy it takes in the data warehouse to store it. The de declaration also addresses uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Now everyone has a chat bot at their very fingertips in their search engine. And obviously, there is a lot of empowerment here. But there's also a lot of choices that may be directed in uh, directions where you might not have wanted to go yourself. So uh, here we are with a very obvious thing in front of us, how to avoid that people are being discriminated in a world that is so full of it already. Our proposal for the AI Act, we hope the trilogues will start very soon, they strictly regulate the use of technologies. For instance, any form of social scoring by governments will be banned. So will it be for AI systems that use subliminal techniques in order to cause harm. In Europe, there's also no room for mass surveillance. And that is why we propose to ban the use of remote biometric identification in public spaces. Very narrow exemptions for extreme cases. <laughs> this is the world we live in. Such as when police authorities need as for a specific, specific cause. But the point is, of course, that we can push and then we hopefully can get to a proportionate but also a risk-based approach. So the higher the risk, the stricter the approach. The declaration uh, also addresses uh, our commitment to uphold the open nature of the internet. Already back in 2015, we adopted uh, the net neutrality regulation. And I know this is very, very close to your heart for very good reasons. Last month, month, we launched a consultation on the future of connectivity to gather views on the growing demands of connectivity, technological advances, how they may affect future developments and needs. And there are no preconceived conclusions. So I would really encourage you to contribute. And you have till May, so it will not have to ruin this party. 
looking into the future, of course, we will continue monitoring uh, new digital opportunities and trends. And as said, the most obvious one is already here for some purposes, is the metaverses, the virtual realities. And uh, we plan to present an initiative uh, on this, but again, with no pre-conclusions. So many opportunities are being offered. And if there is a lot of opportunity, it's almost always mirrored in a lot of risks. So also here, I hope that you will help out. Because there's no way that we can make the best of the virtual world if people do not feel safe, if they cannot trust the technology. So we will continue to watch out very, very carefully with the same very fundamental strategic choice taken early on, that technology must serve us as humans, as citizens. And it goes without saying that we count on your vigilance when you think that we are being too soft of technology or too soft of, on business and not sufficiently strict on this strategic choice for Europe. We will also now, of course, focus our resources on implementing what we have decided. Because as said, looking at the GDPR, the complaints have helped us get on track. And implementation is everything. If it's not implemented, not worth it. So for this, we need your help. We need your unique network of national or associations to closely monitor how our rules are implemented public bodies, the research community, civil society. There is no way that we can implement well without you. So we need to join forces because we share the fundamentals. So thank you very much to each and every one of you because um, just as well as this is a proper pause to celebrate. And I think actually it's anything but navel gazing. This is to pause, to look at one another, to cherish what has been achieved. And in doing so, getting together and finding the power and the commitment to continue. As said, technology is here to serve people. There is no NGO without people. It's an organization, it's a framework. And because of that, my thank is to each and every one of you, each and every one to, who took a step on the way, each and every one who contributed. Because if technology is to serve people, then there's only people to make sure that it happens. So congratulations on 20 years. Thank you very, very much. Looking forward to our next endeavors.